So I'm willing to bet that uh, each of you in this room here today has in some way been touched by cancer. But if you think about it, that's a very strange way to talk about cancer. Being told that you or someone close to you has cancer isn't really like being touched. It's more like being hit with a wrecking ball. Now, we declared war on cancer in 1971, over 40 years ago. At the time, James Watson, the co-discoverer of DNA's double helix, said that this was a war we couldn't possibly win because we didn't know who the enemy was. Now, since then, the US alone has spent over $100 billion on cancer research, trying to figure out who that enemy is. In the last few years, there's been a change in the way scientists think about cancer. In the next few years, there's going to be a complete shift in the way we treat cancer. And this is going to be a realization of all those years of cancer research, as well as a revolution in DNA sequencing. So cancer's not a single disease. It actually refers to over 200 different diseases, mainly because there's 200 different types of cell in the body. Now, cancers are much more complex than that. And as we understand that complexity, we should first understand how people get cancer. Cancer arises because of changes in the DNA, the genome. Now, the genome is made up of 23 chromosomes. It's responsible for running the cell. It gives us 6 billion letters of a four-letter code. as on about 20,000 different genes. Now, the DNA in your cells is constantly being damaged and repaired. And this damage comes from normal day-to-day -day chemical processes happening in the cell, as well as from the environment, so chemicals, toxins, and sunlight. Now, when the DNA gets damaged and doesn't get repaired properly, a change or mutation can happen. And in the 6 billion character book, which is your genome, that change or mutation could be a misspelling or a typo, or a whole page missing, or multiple copies of the same paragraph. Now, often that change has no effect on the cell, but every so often that change can occur in a gene which is involved in controlling cell growth. Now, on the one hand, the, the, and so these are called driving mutations. On the one hand, the driving mutation could occur in a gene which is involved in speeding up cell growth, and the mutation is going to stick that accelerator to the floor. On the other hand, the mutation can occur in a gene which is involved in slowing down cell growth. And if you have a car which the brakes are disconnected and the accelerator is stuck to the floor, it's going to be out of control. So why are cancers so complex? Well, the answer is that, the set, that each cancer is completely unique. And the set of mutations which drive one cancer are often completely different to the set of mutations driving another. So if you take two patients, take cells from two patients with lung cancer, look at those cells down the microscope, they're quite often going to be indistinguishable. But those two cancers can have a completely different set of driving mutations. So each cancer is individual. But in the past, that's not how we've tried to treat cancer. Conventional cancer treatments take advantage of the fact that cancer cells like to grow and divide more rapidly than the cells around them. As a result, chemotherapy works by damaging DNA with the hope that this is going to cause the cells which are growing and dividing more rapidly to die. It's essentially like putting a speed bump in front of this out-of-control car, hoping to take it off the road. Unfortunately, chemotherapy also damages normal, healthy cells. So a speed bump can still damage a car, even if its brakes and accelerator are working just fine. Chemotherapy causes more mutations. In normal, healthy cells, this can lead to secondary cancers. And in the tumor itself, that can lead to a new ability for that tumor to resist the chemotherapy and grow back more aggressively. So how would we like to treat cancer? Well, if we could have some way of targeting the unique differences of cancer, some way of knowing the core driving mutations in each cancer, then we could develop and use drugs to target those specific differences. So before we know what makes a cancer cell different, we need a copy of the normal book, or the reference genome. And this was the goal of the Human Genome Project. It started in 1985, and with the technology available at the time, this was nothing less than a huge undertaking. It cost a billion dollars to complete. It took 18 years to get finished, and had about 2,000 people working on it. Now, as a scientific investment, the value of the Human Genome Project cannot be overstated. 
it helped massively accelerate scientific research. And it's allowed us to understand the genome in incredible detail. It helped create a whole new science, genomics. So not just what genes are and what they do, but how they interact with each other. Now we don't think of genes as acting in, on their own anymore, but in pathways or circuits within the cell. So we have our reference genome, but if it takes 18 years and a billion dollars to sequence a cancer DNA, that's not going to be of much use to the patient. Well, it turns out those numbers have changed. If you look at this graph from the National Human Genome Research Institute, it shows the falling cost of DNA sequence, or human, sequencing a human genome over time. Now, the white line is Moore's law, so transistor density doubles roughly every two years. And for many years, the cost of sequencing a human genome was falling at about the same rate, which is really fast. This is a log scale. But you can see sometime around 2007, the cost of sequencing suddenly dropped through the floor. We are absolutely light years ahead of where we used to be. What used to cost a billion dollars now costs about $3,000. Later this year, it's going to be about $1,000, and there's even talk of a $100 genome soon. OK, so we have our reference genome. But if it, and we have the ability to sequence a cancer quickly and cheaply. And we've been sequencing them. Now, while the Human Genome Project was a huge undertaking, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project is going to be much, much bigger. It aims to sequence about 20 different cancers, using hundreds of samples for each cancer type. And they're not just using DNA sequencing to tell us what those mutations are, but they're using a whole host of genomics techniques in order to tell us what those mutations are actually doing to the cell. So how many differences are there in a cancer cell? Well, we know from the cancers we've sequenced so far that, for example, in pancreatic cancer, there's about 50 differences. Now, not all those differences are driving mutations. A lot are just random mutations or passengers along for the ride. Now, figuring out the difference between a driving mutation and a passenger mutation has been and continues to be a major challenge for, re for research. But we think of those 50 differences, in each cancer, there's about four to 10 driving mutations. Now, out of all the cancers we've sequenced so far, and from our research we've done, we think there are about 200 possible different driving mutations. And this really underscores the staggering complexity of cancer. But I told you that genomics has changed the way we think about genes. And those 200 genes can be divided into about 12 biological pathways. Now, to target 12 pathways is still going to be complex, but we think that's a lot more manageable. So we have the reference genome. We have the ability to sequence cancer genomes quickly and cheaply, and we know a lot about the targets already. Will this new form of targeted cancer therapy ever be a reality? Well, it already is. Chronic myeloid leukemia, or CML, is a rare but very simple cancer. It contains a translocation or a swap between part of one chromosome, chromosome 9, and chromosome 22. Now, this creates a brand new gene product, not seen in normal healthy cells. Now, this is Brian Drucker. Now, he was working on CML at the time. And he had the simple but at the time groundbreaking idea that if you could stop this gene product from working, you might be able to stop the cancer. Now, as luck would have it, at the time, there was a company developing chemicals against this type of gene product as a scientific tool. It took Brian Drucker five years to persuade them to even start a clinical trial. Now, the only way to cure CML before this was with a bone marrow transplant. And this had two problems. Firstly, in the first year after the bone marrow transplant, the death rate was 25%. And secondly, only about a third of patients were actually eligible for that bone marrow transplant. Brian Drucker started his clinical trial with 31 patients. And of those 31 patients, 100% achieved complete remission. The drug Gleevec has changed the five-year survival rate of these patients from 30% to 90%, or close to what it would be if they didn't have the disease. So this single drug against a single target has effectively changed a 
what was a death sentence into a chronic but manageable condition. And we think that by using multiple drugs against this single target, we can effectively cure this disease. So now the bad news. At the moment, we cannot claim to be able to cure all cancers, even if we know all the targets and have all the drugs available to us. The, the heterogeneity of cancer, so the, the genetic differences in a tumour are all over the tumour itself. And so we might not be able to target just one or two pathways, but have to target three or four or even more combinations. And what those combinations are going to be are going to be different for everybody. Now, really, we'd like to not have to fight this battle in the first place. We need to do a lot more to prevent cancer and to improve tests and technologies so that they can diagnose cancer at the earliest possible stages where it's easiest to treat. But we can start to imagine a time where we walk into a doctor's office, not get diagnosed with breast or lung cancer, but being given an exact molecular diagnosis based on the genes and pathways that have become mutated in your cancer, and not be given the same treatment as the patient who walks in before you, but being given an individual treatment plan based on your cancer as well as the unique differences in your genome. So this is personalised precision medicine. And with it, we can start to imagine that being told you have cancer won't ever again be like being hit by a wrecking ball. Thank you.